The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Vivian Young with 1000 Friends of Florida, and I'd like you to welcome you to our uh, webinar, Sustainable Landscaping Principles and Practices. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background about 1000 Friends. We were founded in 1986 as a not-for-profit membership organization, and we focus on saving special places and building better communities. As a not-for-profit organization, um, we try to offer as many services as we can, including this free webinar series, email alerts, and other things. And we certainly appreciate donations and membership to help support this work. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Dr. John M. DeGrove, um, he is an icon of comprehensive planning both in Florida and across the nation and one of the founders of 1000 Friends of Florida. He had a very strong personal passion for education, so we're honored to uh, dedicate this webinar series in his name. Uh, the reason we're able to offer these webinars for free is thanks to our sponsors, and I'd like to um, name some of them, the Archibald Foundation, Mosaic, Mr. Ronald Book, Kadina Management, uh, Ms. Kimberly A. DeGrove and Dr. Parton, the Dickman Law Firm, William Howard Flowers Jr. Foundation, Kitson and Partners, the Perkins Charitable Foundation, um, and Robert M. Rhodes. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors and supporters who also have made this uh, free webinar series possible. I wanted to give you some information um, on some of our upcoming free events. Um, for those of you who are in Palm Beach County, on November 27th, we're having a workshop, Palm Beach County 2070, What's Next? It's from 6 to 7.30, and uh, there's no registration required. The next night, November 28th, from 6 to 7.30, we're holding Martin County 2070, What's Next? workshop um, in Stewart, and again, no registration is required. Uh, we have started programming some of our upcoming webinars next month. Um, on Thursday, December 6th, uh, from noon until 1.30, we're going to be holding a webinar on Recycle Right to Meet Industry Challenges. And in February, we are starting our always popular uh, legislative series on Tuesday, January 22nd. We're going to be holding our 2019 Florida Legislative Preview webinar. Um, and registration information and location information for the workshops is at our website at 1000friendsofflorida.org slash webinar. Um, we encourage everybody who participates in our webinars to consider either becoming a member, um, making a donation, or becoming a program sponsor. Um, here is some of the information there. Um, if you um, are, are daunted by five thousand dollars, even ten thousand, or I mean, even ten dollar or thirty-five dollar gifts are appreciated, and you can make donations online to us. Um, for those of you who are here for professional certification credits, um, this has been approved for 1.5 AICPCM credits for planners, 1 CEC for certified floodplain managers, 2 CLE for Florida attorneys, 1.5 CEUs for Florida environmental health professionals, and due to very popular demand, and thanks to Timothy Salen, who's one of the presenters who guided us on this, um, we've now been approved to offer landscape architecture credits by the Florida Department of uh, Business and Professional Regulation, and this event has been approved for 1.5 credit hours. Um, a little bit more homework. Um, there is a link to a brief survey that you will get in a follow-up email about an hour after the webinar. Um, we really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to give us feedback on this webinar and suggestion on future topics. Um, if you have sound issues during the webinar, we are in three different locations. Um, we're not in sound booths, so our sound may fluctuate from person to person. Uh, the first option is to adjust the uh, speaker on your computer if somebody comes in too loud or too soft. If you have ongoing issues, your control panel has an audio icon. You can do a sound check or switch to a uh, telephone. Uh, the PowerPoint is available both on our website um, under What's New. Um, if you click on that link, it has uh, both the uh, PowerPoint and a brief handout that talks about 
the definition of sustainable landscape principles and practices, and also actually it's called handouts on your control panel. Uh, both of those documents are loaded there as well. We hope you'll have questions. We allocate about 20 to 30 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Um, at any time during the webinar, you can get to your control panel, uh, maximize the questions panel by clicking on the little icon here and entering and submitting questions. We do answer as many of them as possible. Um, so please send questions in throughout the webinar. Um, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our, our two presenters today, and then we'll get right down to business. Um, our first presenter is Timothy Salen, um, who is actively involved in water conservation, sustainable landscaping, and responsible agriculture in Florida for over the past 15 years through his role as president of Cherry Lake. Um, and there's more information on Cherry Lake here. Um, he's very passionate about connecting people to plants and promoting healthy ecosystems. And um, we're very pleased that he is now on the board of 1000 Friends of Florida to provide us guidance on sustainability issues related to landscaping and other issues. Our second presenter today is Pierce Jones. He's a professor at the University of Florida and directs the Program for Resource Efficient Communities, um, which is an interdisciplinary group that promotes adoption of best design, construction, and management practices. And he has a background in mechanical engineering. At this point, um, I am going to uh, turn the presentation over. It will take me a moment to do this, if you'll be patient with me. Okay, and Timothy and Pierce, you're both on the line now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, this is Timothy Salen speaking, and I'll start um, the first couple slides. I uh, want to thank everyone for listening in today. The title of our presentation is Sustainable Landscaping Principles and Practice. So to begin with, I would like to propose a few working definitions for sustainable landscaping. The first is to provide equivalent value to society with landscaping while minimizing inputs, primarily water, nutrients, horticultural chemicals, labor, fuel, and equipment. And we'll talk more about this as we get into the presentation. And I think it's really about maintaining value while minimizing impact, which we can measure through inputs. The second definition really builds upon the first, which is to say that in addition to minimizing inputs, we can seek to increase the societal value landscaping provides by incorporating functional and environmental goals, such as stormwater management, water quality, wildlife habitat, heat reduction, energy efficiency, economic development, and human health and well-being. Um, that's not to say that our conventional landscaping doesn't address these issues to some degree, but primarily a lot of the landscaping that we're currently doing is focused on curb appeal, beautification, and maybe erosion control. So we can expand that and provide more functional environmental values. This presentation is a collaboration between myself and Dr. Jones. And for the past 10 years, Pierce and I have exchanged ideas and information on best practices, uh, research ongoing at the University of Florida and elsewhere, and industry trends relating to sustainable landscaping in Florida. So our collaboration is a partnership between academia and industry. And we believe that this intersection is critical to the development and eventually the widespread adoption of sustainable landscaping practices. In recent years, both Dr. Jones and I have had the opportunity to work on several projects that have incorporated sustainable landscaping practices. And this is helping us to define a path forward for shifting the landscaping paradigm in Florida towards a more sustainable approach. And this is part of a broader conversation, which includes all the engaged industry professionals, academic and research professionals, government agencies and nonprofits who are interested in sustainable landscaping. And 
I expect that that's most of you listening today. So we're really excited about not only giving this presentation, but hearing back from you through the questions and hopefully um, with some follow-up afterwards to, to connect um, with those in the audience on this topic. Uh, so we're gonna start by going over current context and conditions, and then we'll look at case studies, best practices and research. And in closing, Pierce and I would like to discuss next level ideas for how to move the industry forward and creating a framework for the implementation of sustainable landscaping at an industry scale. Specifically, we will discuss how the development of quantifiable standards and third party certification can create market incentive as well as regulatory accountability for these practices. So to start with the context, uh, I think it's good to look at the demographic trends and 1,000 Friends of Florida and University of Florida have been involved in the Florida 2070 report and the Water 2070 report, which is very helpful for all of us thinking about the future of the state. And I highly encourage you to look into this if you haven't already seen uh, the reports. But the highlights are that population in the state is growing. And uh, today in 2018, we may be around 18 to 19 million people in the state of Florida, but the projection is that we will reach 33 and a half million by 2070, which is 13 and a half million more people and very close to doubling. So this is uh, going to obviously impact natural resources and our built environment. Um, the study provides some interesting uh, graphics that show what our current development pattern is. That would be the baseline on the left and what the development pattern would look like in 2070 if we continued forward with the same practices in terms of land conservation, land use, and so forth. Um, alternatively, the report does propose a, a vision of how we can accommodate the same amount of people with a lighter footprint on our natural resources. So um, this is available in more depth on the 1000 Friends website, and um, I encourage you guys to look into that. Um, but now Pierce is gonna follow on and, and talk more about the context for sustainable landscaping. Thank you very much, Tim. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I want to remind everybody that I'm much older than Tim. I was born in Florida in 1946. When I was born here, there were only 3 million people. So those numbers are, are amazing to me. Pierce, um, this is Vivian. Yes. As a reminder, you need to um, accept showing your screen. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Um, so the question is, uh, going forward, will land development continue to follow current practices? Uh, and what does that look like? What do current practices look like? And uh, to those of you who have seen my presentations before, uh, you'll recognize these. Um, generally, uh, on large projects, there's mass clearing. Uh, there's generally a contour map for that site. Uh, so the soil is highly disrupted and compacted in the development process uh, with the purpose of creating high ground where roads and homes can go, uh, and then areas where stormwater can go. It's almost, a, it's actually a very simple process. Um, once the initial development work is done, um, the horizontal portion of the project's installed, uh, roads, sidewalks, uh, sewer and water communications, and then those lots are turned over to home builders. And home builders bring in additional fill um, and again, the fill is essentially inert. Uh, as homes are, are finished in ground irrigation and turf landscapes are installed to very quickly make homes presentable for sale. Underlying soil conditions offer only minimal support to these landscapes, which uh, ends up making them require fairly intensive management. And once the home builder is gone, the responsibility falls on the homeowner to maintain these landscapes. So. These master plan projects don't just create intensive landscapes for the short term, uh, but HOA requirements persist and have the force of law 
And just one example, in October 2008, uh, Joe Prudente, who lives in Bayonet Point in Pasco County, was actually put in jail uh, in a dispute with his HOA over resodding his lawn, which had fallen below HOA standards. So those kinds of conventional projects um, certainly um, each can involve thousands of homes, these larger projects. And of course, in the aggregate, those projects and multiple thousands of homes have impact on regional water supply. So as one example, back in 2009, actually six months after Joe Prudente went to jail, uh, his water utility, Tampa Bay Water, had to cease its use of surface water from the Hillsborough River. Uh, effectively, uh, the reservoir was drained at that point. If you, I don't know if you all recall, but there was a very severe drought starting in 2007 uh, through 2009. The good news, news for Tampa Bay um, water customers is that they, uh, in fact, have three major sources of water. The Florida Aquifer is one. Uh, the water in the reservoir, which is supplied by the Hillsborough River and the uh, Alafia River. Um, and then finally, uh, they have built a desal plant, which in 2008, 2009 came into play. Um, and these gra this graph basically shows the stacked columns show the million gallons per day supplied by each of those three sources. So for example, in 2006, 46 million gallons per day was coming from the reservoirs and 137 million gallons per day was coming from the Florida aquifer. By 2009, the desal plant had come on, on and was supplying about 10% of the total water supply for Tampa Bay water. Um, so that sounds like good news. Uh, unfortunately, it takes about 20 times as much energy to generate a gallon of desal water as it does to deliver it from groundwater or surface water. So in 2009, the 10% 10, 10 of water supplied by desal increased the electric cost for water production by over 150%. Um, point being that if we continue in the direction we're going when there are droughts and we have to depend on desal water and that becomes a standard supply source of water, then the cost for that water is going to go up. And this does not take into account servicing the debt for the uh, desal plant or the employees that are required for the desal plant or the chemicals or anything else. It's only the electricity to run the plant. In addition to impacting water demand, landscaping practices and master plan developments uh, can impact water quality. Uh, this is not just a Florida problem. Um, a science article published back in 2009 described the eutrophication of aquatic ecosystems worldwide and the role that fertilizers play in causing harmful algal blooms uh, and dead zones like uh, in the Gulf of Mexico at the mouth of the Mississippi River. The images shown along the right-hand side of the slide um, are the sailing venue at the 2008 Beijing Olympics, uh, which had a macrophytic algal bloom <laughs> that had to be cleared by hand just so the sailing boats could actually sail through that water. Um, the second one is the, the floor of uh, the North Sea in Denmark in the North Sea, as I said. And then the last one is Lake Okeechobee. So this problem has uh, been occurring worldwide for a number of years. Um, and back to our conventional development practices and that intensive landscape management, uh, because of the soils conditions that typically compacted and disrupted soils in these mass cleared land development projects uh, and the intensive inputs required to keep the landscape functioning, uh, organic and inorganic fertilizers are uh, a key component of that. Uh, those fertilizers are mobile and have the potential to leak into natural systems. Um, in 2005, uh, there were a couple of uh, blue-green algal blooms in the St. John's River um, that occurred in mid-August and again in September. And in fact, to this day, uh, the lower St. John's is impaired for nutrients, meaning nitrogen and phosphorus. So this is now effectively a persistent problem that requires management through BMAPs uh, in the lower St. John's and in fact, the old St. John's River. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the relative impact, uh, but there are three primary sources of nutrient loading, septic tanks, agriculture, and landscapes. Uh, back in 2005, 
uh, when I actually saw those algal blooms, which in the morning with the sun coming up were actually quite lovely when they were young blooms. Um, but I did look into uh, just one indicator of how fertilizers are being used in Northeast Florida. And I looked at three counties and you can see two columns. The column uh, 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 on the left, agricultural fertilizer use. So St. John's County, where we grow a lot of potatoes and cabbages and so forth, produced, uh, used 22, uh, nearly 23 tons uh, in 2005 of fertilizers. And in Duval County, which of course is just a very highly populated community, that second column is non-agricultural use. And so you can see the quantities of fertilizers being used in Duval County for non-agricultural uses. So that's the trend that we would like to address uh, is how we reduce the, the loading to the environment uh, of these chemicals. And of course, uh, everybody knows that today this is a very hot topic in Florida. For the last several years, blue-green al algal blooms have been occurring uh, in both East and West South Florida, uh, and then the red tide, which the, the relationship between these things that I'm describing and those algal blooms is, is not completely clear, uh, but it's highly suspected, as that science article suggested, that this is a, uh, is a problem worldwide. I do want to mention that these images that I'm now showing are from John Moran, who is a fabulous uh, photographer that uh, keeps us alert to what our communities are looking like. I would say uh, that the problem in recent years is not getting better. And with that, I'm going to turn it back. Uh, I'm going to look at um, uh, landscaping impacts uh, uh, in a more quantifiable fashion. There are four practices that we've considered uh, mowing, fertilizing, pesticides, and irrigation. Um, and I've looked at those practices uh, in the context of what the University of Florida IFAS recommends. Uh, this is a uh, page from the Florida Friendly Landscaping Handbook. And uh, just as one example, uh, basic nitrogen fertilization uh, uh, recommended for soja grass in Central Florida is three to six pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. If you use those recommendations, the mowing recommendations, the irrigation recommendations, then you can calculate, um, for example, with mowing, how much gas is being combusted over the course of a year uh, to, to, to mow a lawn. And you can convert that into pounds CO2 equivalent per thousand square feet, just as a means of comparing those practices. And what this uh, table uh, shows for those four practices is that um, the carbon footprint of mowing roughly 15 pounds per thousand square feet fertilizers 29 double the mowing impact surprisingly irrigation uh, goes calculated at more than even the fertilizer 34 pounds for just moving the high volumes of water that are required for irrigation and if you go back to what i said earlier about the uh, tampa bay water that's groundwater that gives us that number. If we go to desal water, it's enormous. Um, so uh, it becomes, uh, um, it just kind of reiterates the absurdity of building a desal facility while using our highest quality water to irrigate landscapes. Uh, and, and again, there's a strong incentive for us to develop much more resource efficient landscapes. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Well, thank you, Pierce. Um, at this stage, I want to speak a little bit about what's currently uh, happening within our industry as some of the best practices in the landscape industry. And um, this slide here is an idea that I think is helpful when thinking about the critical steps and how they're all connected in sequence. The chain of custody basically looks at the development and delivery of a landscaping system from start to finish. And we wanna have connections between the key players in the chain of custody. When you think about how our industry is structured today, 
there's an awful lot of um, separation and a lot of these trades are working in silos. Landscape architects and designers uh, unfortunately don't have a lot of influence over the rest of the process. Sometimes they do, but most times they don't. Um, nurseries are working kind of out on the farm with very little connection um, or influence. And then you'll see where on a project you could have a dozen different contractors involved, different irrigation contractors, different landscape installation contractors, and then a whole slew of maintenance contractors, either simultaneously or just rotating one after the other, being brought in and kicked out of the project over time. So there's a lot of fragmentation, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information loss um, at each stage of, uh, when you make a transfer in the chain of custody. So when we think holistically about sustainable landscaping, I think it's going to be important for our industry to find ways to integrate and to provide more continuity across this process with the goal of holding all players accountable to achieving certain standards. As Pierce was talking about, we're beginning to define quantifiable standards, whether that be for CO2 emissions, pesticide use, fertilizer use, water, water usage, all of these things can be quantified. I believe that the path is to define standards and then uh, hold people accountable in order to achieve uh, certification. Well, that will be much more likely to occur if there is integration and coordination across this chain of custody. So over the next few slides, I want to talk about some, some points that um, may be helpful to consider at each stage um, if our goal is to deliver a sustainable landscaping system. So beginning with design, um, this is a very important step. Obviously, um, a, lot, a lot is established here um, and will carry forwards all the way through to the end. The recommendation that I would, I would provide is that we start by looking at the existing current conditions of the site. Um, in order for landscapes to be sustainable, we would like for them to use fewer inputs. And in order for plants to use fewer inputs, external inputs, we need them to be successful at drawing those inputs uh, from, from the soils and the, and, and the site that they find themselves in. So different, different plants are adapted to different soil and hydrological conditions. Um, understanding what soils we're dealing with, what hydro periods we have, what's happening with the water table um, over the course of the seasons really helps to select plant communities that are suited for the habitat types. Um, this is an approach that is not commonly used uh, in, in, in landscaping of commercial sites, although this is an approach that is very common in environmental science fields where we're looking more at um, ecological restoration or uh, habitat conservation and restoration. So uh, the science is there, the professionals are there who understand these, these techniques. Um, moving forward uh, beyond, beyond site conditions, Paying attention to the Florida-friendly principles. Uh, they're excellent principles that, that help to give a lot of direction to, to design. Species selections, of course, is very important. Irrigation design is fundamental, and I'll speak a little bit more about irrigation um, in a moment. And then your designers, landscape architects, have uh, a lot of uh, influence over the continuation of the process by defining specifications and standards and the better these specifications and standards are, the more precise, um, the, uh, the more likely it is that there could be good con continuity across the chain of custody. And of course, uh, it's great to have landscape architects and designers involved all the way through construction. Our company is a, uh, an integrated landscape company. We do uh, nursery, of course, we grow trees, palms, shrubs, and we also do landscape construction, irrigation construction on commercial sites and landscape maintenance. So we're, we're involved across a number of different of these steps. But as a landscape contractor, 
we find there's a tremendous amount of added value when landscape architects and designers are involved in the construction observation process. The nursery has an important role to play in delivering sustainable landscaping, and that um, has to do with the quality of the, of the plant material that's available. Uh, first and foremost, I believe, is a focus on root systems. When we talk about uh, being able to draw in um, inputs from the surrounding soils and landscape, that's a function of the root systems. The, the healthier and more dynamic your root systems are, the more able the plant is to, to find its own water and, and, and nutrients. Uh, genetics is very important uh, from the standpoint that nurseries have a big role to play in, in promoting biodiversity, making sure that we're introducing a lot of uh, genetic diversity into the, um, into the plants that make it into our industry, and also that we're selecting genetics that are suitable for uh, the environments that we're planting in, making sure that our seed sources are coming from strong parent trees that have been grown in, in local native conditions. Trunk and crown structure is, is critical. Um, and then inventory availability. Uh, nurseries have a responsibility to produce the inventory that um, is needed in order to deliver these landscapes, whether it's Florida-friendly plant selections, native plants, or specific, specific varieties and sizes that, that designers are going to be looking for. Um, irrigation. There's a lot of technology now that's available to deliver excellent irrigation systems. And it's probably true that we can reduce our irrigation consumption by a very significant amount without changing anything other than the irrigation design and components. So if we're looking to save 30 to 50 percent uh, water consumption compared to conventional landscaping practices, that is most likely attainable just by going to uh, pressure regulation, low volume, uh, flow sensors, smart controllers, Start, we're starting to see some research um, coming out of the University of Florida on this, and, um, and, and that's the first step. Um, central control is a very interesting uh, trend, which would take a larger subdivision and put all of the irrigation management under central control. So if you have turnkey um, maintenance through the HOA, then it becomes possible to hire professional landscape maintenance company who would actually set irrigation run times for all of the homes. Um, this is a double-edged sword, as we'll see in some of Pierce's data later. If your maintenance company isn't professional and isn't managing the water and, and isn't held to a standard, then they could overwater on a large scale, which, which would be a problem. But the, the promise is that with a professional landscape maintenance company who has control over the irrigation run times, you can uh, you could really impact your irrigation consumption on a large scale. So the key, I think, in irrigation design is is really taking advantage of the technology, convincing our owners uh, that uh, this is an investment worth making. Um, moving through the chain of custody, when it gets to the landscape contractor who is going to be responsible for the installation, their responsibility here is to promote optimal establishment minimize stress on the plants and ensure that they're going to be able to uh, transition into their new environment and, and thrive. Uh, securing quality nursery stock is often the responsibility of the contractor, and this is critical if we want to uh, deliver sustainable landscaping, we're going to have to bring in the right nursery product. Adhere to design intent. Uh, if we have landscape architects who are uh, designing specifically to achieve certain uh, performance goals with regards to sustainability and the minimization of inputs, we need to make sure that our landscape contractors are not cutting out all of these, um, these benefits from the design through value engineering. Uh, we want our installation contractors to follow best practices and to think about the future, not just about how fast we can plant the trees, but um, how these trees and plants are going to perform over time. And that requires horticultural know-how and a commitment to, uh, to delivering sustainable landscaping. And then lastly, uh, if your landscape contractor is not going to be your maintenance contractor, 
you want a good turnover uh, to the maintenance team where the information is passed on um, and that we have a continuity as we move from one link in the chain to the next. Maintenance um, is the last and, and enduring state or stage in this chain of custody. And it, it probably has one of the biggest roles in, in the broader picture of sustainable landscaping. The goal is to minimize inputs and to optimize plant health. The two of these work together by optimizing uh, your inputs, you will optimize plant health. Um, in other words, we can reduce water, we can reduce fertility, we can reduce horticultural chemicals, and we can increase the plant's natural resilience and ability to uh, derive uh, sustenance uh, for itself. If we're going to move in towards certification and accountability to standards, we need maintenance companies who can quantify um, the inputs that are being applied to the landscapes and document, track, uh, track what they're doing with logs so that then we can uh, certify and hold them accountable. And maintenance companies have the ability to um, develop their employees around very important skill sets of horticulture and plant health, as well as uh, sustainability and helping their employees understand their role in managing the landscape and minimizing inputs. So we need to take a, uh, a 12 or $13 an hour employee and develop them into a higher, higher level skilled employee who can uh, help maintain the professional, uh, professionalism that will be required of maintenance companies if we're going to comply with certification programs in the future. Uh, so there's a lot that can be done. Um, this is a circle of inputs, uh, nutrients, water, soils, chemicals, labor, and fuel. Um, all of these are, are, are critical to optimizing the plant's health and natural resilience. Unfortunately, if one of these inputs gets out of alignment, then we find ourselves kind of having to chase uh, chase that by adding more inputs uh, in other areas. So a, a, a simple example is water. We tend to overwater plants, and when we overwater plants, we're going to lead to uh, more um, pest pressure and, and fungus pressure, which will require us to put more chemicals on. And that will also probably cause the plants to grow faster uh, which means we have more nutrients and then we have to mow the grass more often so we have more f fuel and labor. So by overwatering, by putting too much of one input, we really kind of stretch ourselves in the other dimensions. So finding a balance oftentimes means minimizing inputs and, and, and dialing it in to the point where the plant is able to, to be optimized. Uh, we're going to move into some case studies. Uh, Pierce has a number of really excellent projects he's going to talk about. I just want to speak about one that uh, our company recently was involved with. This is in Claremont, Florida, where, where I live. And it's, I believe, one of the most exciting sustainable landscaping projects um, that I've seen this year. Uh, it's a active stormwater management system and public park that is in the downtown area of Claremont. Uh, Claremont has been working on a master plan to uh, activate its downtown area and to create uh, economic development and tourism uh, for the area around Lake Mineola. This is a nine and a half million dollar project that was completed about a month ago. And what it does is it captures all the stormwater from the streets along the downtown area, which is conveyed via uh, swales into this park where it's going to be held and filtered by moving through various stages that you can see on this diagram. And when it gets into uh, the later stages, the water is being filtered by the plants. Uh, and through this biofiltration, the nutrients are removed, the water is cleansed, and that allows the water then to um, make its way into Lake Mineola in a very clean, a state. So this is the, the water now uh, on its way to the lake. This is a great example of, of the second definition of sustainable landscaping where we're increasing societal value. 
this project is going to revitalize the downtown, creating economic value for all the properties along the master plan corridor. It's taking the stormwater from the individual commercial lots along the streets of the downtown, meaning that the developers can now develop on these lots without having to allocate land to retention. And it's cleaning the water uh, while providing a place for people to meet. There's a triathlon beach, there's an event lawn, there's a lookout tower, and it's educating the public about environmental uh, practices and the importance of clean water. So with one landscaping project, we've accomplished many goals and it's just very exciting to see uh, this uh, particular project and for us to have been involved with it. Uh, Pierce is now going to speak to us about a few other projects. So the first project I'd like to talk about is um, restoration, which is in Volusia County. <coughs> Uh, it was originally designed uh, as an 8,500 home gated adult active golf course community with lots spread throughout the site's uplands, avoiding wetlands as best as possible. Uh, but in 2006, the design ran into some regulatory uh, opposition and the developer opted to move to a more compact design uh, that looked like this. Um, the, this design has the same number of homes, but it actually had a, a, an additional million plus square feet of commercial space. The golf course was eliminated. One of the major north-south arteries, roads, a six lane divided was eliminated. Uh, so the two designs um, offered us at the university a chance to quantify and compare resource requirements for uh, a conventional design, the gated golf course community on quarter acre lots essentially, uh, with a much more compact design. And just uh, to give you a, uh, not necessarily directly related to this presentation, but for looking at the roadways, uh, we could take the lengths of all of the categories of roadways, such as six lane divided, um, that were called for in each design, basically sum them up and compare their characteristics. And that would look something like this. Uh, the 2006 plan, for example, had 72 uh, lineal miles of roadway compared with 39 miles for the 2009 plan, the more compact plan. And you can look at the impact that that had on uh, lane miles, 186 compared to 103. And then impervious surface area was cut by 7 million square feet from 17 to 10 million. The landscaped area along the verge and in the medians was cut from 6 million to 3 million square feet. So from the developer's point of view, um, uh, and, and I don't think the developer had even considered this when he first wanted to go to a compact design, but the initial uh, infrastructure investment in roadways was reduced by $145 million by going to this more compact design. So that's just a, an example of how we would like to quantify things. It also, because if there's so much less roadway that had to be built and then later maintained and rebuilt, carbon footprint of the community was tremendously reduced, roughly 6,000 metric tons of CO2 per year eliminated or avoided. So we take this same kind of approach. It's not quite as easy uh, to look at landscaping, but using that rubric that I showed you earlier uh, and recognizing some of the characteristics within that compact community, uh, for example, even though both designs have the same number of dwelling units, the 2009 design is much more compact and has much smaller lots. Uh, so the largest lots being only 60 feet wide, um, some compact homes on a 45 foot wide lot having only 375 square feet of landscapable area, and then less than 25% of the residences having a, a design that would accommodate turf. All of those things then were reducing the inputs uh, needed to manage the, the landscaping within the larger community. Well, you can sum all of those characteristics up. And among other things, if you look at this comparison, the landscapable area was basically cut in half from 1,000 uh, acres to 428. Uh, and then the other characteristics within the community, uh, the entry feature and practices that the developer chose to adopt uh, went even further to, to reduce the carbon footprint of the two communities. 
But that's just an example of how the design could uh, could very systematically uh, reduce the uh, inputs to to the landscaping within the community. Another example uh, from about the same time frame, the university, um, my group, the program for resource efficient communities took an equity position in a small development project, 88 homes on 44 acres. Um, and we were involved in building three homes in the project. The um, project actually started in 2004. The homes were basically built by 2006. These are four of those homes. Only one of these, uh, the one in the upper right is the one that the university that I built, but the other three were built by other local builders. Um, you can see there was no mass clearing. We used stem wall construction. As a result, the soil in the project was not widely disrupted and the natural canopy was effectively retained and then could be integrated into the landscaping. And although it may not look like it, there was a lot of actual installed landscaping around these homes. Uh, you can take a guess for yourself what you think average water consumption in these homes might be. You can also guess whether or not there's any fertilizer needed in these landscapes. Uh, I can give you a very precise answer on how much water is being used. Uh, this is a, a graph or a screenshot of a, a geovisualization system that we have built for various water utilities. It shows you the first phase of Madera. There were 18 homes in that phase. If you look at that blue dot, uh, that is all potable water. There is no, there are no dual meters, so there are no irrigation or reclaim meters. Average water consumption for all the homes in those eight of those 18 is 132 gallons per day per household. Uh, note that there's one home in that community that is black. Uh, those homes are actually uh, shaded according to their water consumption. So that one home uh, was actually using 684 gallons per day. Uh, for comparison, uh, in, in the larger uh, Alachua County area, we looked at 5,000 homes over the course of five years from 2009 through 2013. We basically found that single family detached homes with irrigation systems on average use 358 gallons a day. So the Madera homes were doing quite well, uh, certainly compared to the homes with irrigation, even compared to homes single family detached without irrigation. Uh, Community-wide, they were using roughly 190 gallons per day. Apartments were using 116, and condominium units were using 94. So we were quite happy that 10 years after we built those homes in Madera, uh, the water conservation goal, goal was absolutely being met. Uh, another little bit of information about being able to quantify impacts of uh, landscaping uh, practices. The Toho Water Authority in Osceola County uh, was another utility that we've worked with and have their data. They asked us to evaluate the Florida Water Star program. The reason is that uh, as a condition of hooking into the water utility, Toho Water Authority began requiring new master planned development projects in their territory to comply with the Florida Water Star program. And so in 2017, Dr. Nick Taylor with, with UF was asked to analyze the impact of Florida Water Star program because we had a very large uh, population of those homes in Osceola County because of Toho's program. And the results, uh, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but on the left in the green, those are Florida Water Star homes uh, in 2015 through 2016 calendar year. Um, they reduced demand in those homes compared to homes that were not Florida Water Star uh, landscapes by um, 118 gallons per day on average throughout that year. Uh, the sample size is 145 homes that were Florida Water Star homes. That's the good news. The bad news is this Toho applied the same program to a community that was uh, master maintained and that community actually used more water than comparable homes. Uh, it turned out that that's because the people who were doing the landscape maintenance as, as Timothy uh, alluded to earlier, the, the management team has to buy into this. Well, each of the controllers for each of the individual landscapes was in the garage. They were the low cost bidder. Uh, they did not have the time to go into every single garage and adjust uh, controllers uh, as needed. And therefore they tended to overwater pretty substantially. That problem has since been rectified because the data 
we provided to Toho gave them a heads up and they were able to fix it. And just a, another screenshot to show you, this is a fairly typical new neighborhood in Toho uh, territory. And these homes were all built uh, uh, between 2015 and 2017. Average consumption, total average consumption, 186 gallons per day per household. And you can see the split in the pie chart between irrigation and potable indoor water use. Uh, that's a dual metered home. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of research projects. One is what I've just been showing you uh, in these graphs. Um, we have a project that we refer to uh, a geovisualization of water consumption data uh, merged with property appraiser data, merged with conservation program data, which we call H2O SAVE, stands for Water Savings Analysis and Verification. And that program allows us to look at a full utility territory we can show the averages across all residential units in that territory uh, and the pie chart of which is coming for indoor or potable water use versus irrigation uh, meter use or reclaimed meter use. And then we can color code by, by consumption, the subdivisions, the different uh, neighborhoods as to how they're consuming. Uh, but then we can draw, drill down and we can look at the subdivision internally and we can look at how that water is being consumed, the pattern of consumption within the community uh, you can pick a particular home, the one with the dot on it right in the middle. That particular home is using 1,000 gallons a day. Uh, their irrigation is potable water, uh, and the vast majority of the water they're using is for irrigation. Um, we can uh, drill down into how they're using that water, and this graph just shows you uh, for, 20, I guess, October 7, 2017 through current, uh, shows you gallons per day per household but you can see in that lower bar graph, we have a slider bar there and we can actually see all of the water use back to 2010. So it's a very handy tool to look at how programs have had impacts, what, how people behave during droughts and so forth. Um, a second current research project that I wanted to make you aware of is the work we're doing with um, compost. And this is not just any compost, this is um, Life Soils is a uh, company that's uh, working out of Sumter County, but they have three other Florida locations. They produce a product called Command. Um, we have been very struck by first uh, the way they're going about it, the volumes of compost they're able to produce, uh, the benefits to, from a landfill perspective of this process. Um, uh, but most importantly, we're seeing uh, some very strong horticultural impacts. Uh, this is an example from on top of the world in Marion County. Um, you can see on the left, they uh, are top dressing. They first aerated with a spike aerator, and then they top dress with this compost. In the lower right of that corner, what you're seeing is the compost on the ground. That's not bare soil. And then on the right, literally a week later, uh, this is Empire Zoysia, uh, you see a very strong effect. Well, the same, the same product, we've been uh, using it in uh, the villages, and we have found that people are, are willing uh, after they've uh, used this product, and if you were to look at it as a fertilizer, uh, it's it's would be you know NPK, it would be zero zero zero. It's uh, it's not not the readily available nutrients that are causing that green up in that turf. The thing that's causing that green up is first soil um, uh, water holding capacity that's enhanced by the additional organic matter that the compost provides. But probably even more important uh, is the, that that compost is biologically active. It's uh, got a huge uh, microbial population and the cation exchange benefits, the uh, pH buffering benefits that it provides uh, uh, has a very quick impact. Uh, we're very uh, pleased with it. There is one other thing it does, which we've studied at Citra at the University of Florida, the research station. Uh, it does seem to have nematicide properties uh, and suppressed uh, nematodes. So we're looking at that as something that causes a homeowner to be willing to reduce their water use, number one. And number two, in the villages where we've done this, uh, this is not science yet, but it's an indicator. We've seen homeowners quite willing to not put out inorganic fertilizers, uh, the highly mobile fertilizers. Uh, when their lawn looks like this, they don't think they need it. And uh, we think that's another benefit that the compost can provide as a practice. Uh, we're doing research in both on top of the world and the villages. Uh, and on campus with uh, this product. 
Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Tim. <clears throat> Thank you, Pierce. Um, anecdotally, on on the composting, we're finding that there's a tremendous amount of benefits to getting the soil right when it comes to growing plants. Um, our company is also involved in citrus. We were uh, a grower, packer, and marketer of fresh Florida citrus. We have about 5,000 acres under production. And uh, as most of you know, citrus has been facing a very serious threat in the form of greening. Citrus greening is a bacterial disease that is um, basically infected all the trees in the state of Florida. It's also in Brazil and other parts of the world. What greening does is it restricts the vascular system of the plant. It atrophies the roots, it constricts the flow of nutrients um, through the xylem and the phloem of the plant. Um, so we've learned over the past uh, 15 years of dealing with this disease, new techniques and practices for growing citrus and keeping the trees productive. Um, in fact, we're at the point now where we're aggressively replanting and reinvesting in citrus. We're planting 400,000 new citrus trees per year. And we're doing it because we have a certain degree of confidence that we, we know how to promote a healthy plant despite the disease and despite it being infected. And um, I, I spoke, I've spoken a lot with my, my grower about this to understand, and, and he says that it's primarily soil health. It's putting down the compost, inoculating the soils with bacteria, uh, trichoderma, and different types of, of microorganisms to create the microbiome and we're only just now starting to learn how to do this. So I'm really optimistic about how far we can still go um, as an industry and as we apply soil science to, to promoting healthy and sustainable landscaping. Um, we want to talk about certification. And um, I think certification is one way that we can move the industry forward by creating a voluntary uh, program that helps to quantify quantify the uh, um, the use of inputs and um, when you look at a certification program it needs to be measurable objective uh, and quantifiable it also should focus on outcomes as opposed to prescribing methods for achieving the outcomes and um, I think what Pierce has shown we have a lot of data now. We have the ability to track water consumption. Um, we we could we could put a lot of metrics on on these inputs, and that could lead to um, a better a better standard of certification. So I'm going to talk about a few examples of things that we can certify, and 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 also some examples that that we can learn from. I'm going to go back to citrus. Um, you know, being involved with Citrus, we have been participating in certification programs for over 20 years. And a lot of it is driven by concerns for food safety. So you have uh, private uh, food safety labels, you have governmental food safety labels, and then you have uh, NGOs um, that are dedicated to creating uh, third-party certification protocols to, to work with growers and retailers to make sure that we're distributing food that's safe to be consumed. Um, incidentally, we're actually in the middle of our annual uh, third-party audit for Global Gap uh, today, and we're out in the field with the inspectors. But what they're looking for is, is food safety, but also they're looking at environmental impacts and environmental protection uh, in terms of good agricultural practices in the groves. They're also looking at worker safety. Um, this is accomplished by looking at a tremendous amount of information. So your third party auditors are going to look at your fertilization logs, uh, all, your, all your pesticide and chemical application logs. Uh, they're going to come and observe uh, harvesting in the field. Um, we do water quality tests four times a year, um, pesticide residue testing pre and post harvest. 
uh, with logs again that are, are, are tracked and, and, and made available to the certification uh, agents. Uh, all of our training records are extensively reviewed. Uh, Re-entry records, which is um, tied to worker protection safety. Um, and so um, it goes into a lot of detail, all the way down to our portalit service logs. They want to make sure that you know the portalits are kept clean so that the employees can wash their hands and, and come back into the field. They're not touching the fruit. So all of these things are, are stacked, organized in a certification uh, that is, that is uh, on a point system. So uh, the grower can uh, comply and be rated and meet certain thresholds. And those thresholds then will determine whether that grower is eligible to participate in certain marketplaces. So for example, uh, there are certain standards that you have to meet just to get into the Japanese market or certain standards that you would have to meet if you want to do business with Whole Foods and so forth. And the same thing is available for the packing house. So um, the point being is that these certification practices exist and are in place for other industries. Uh, I think what we could do for sustainable landscaping would be very similar. And it's interesting to note that the food safety programs in Citrus have been voluntary, entirely market driven uh, for the past 20 years. And it's only since last year that the federal government passed the Food Safety Modernization Act and is now making these same practices a requirement, a federal requirement. So we started with 20 years of voluntary adoption and only recently did the federal government kind of catch up with the uh, leading um, uh, private sector. Um, private sector. So uh, the second thing I want to mention is um, wetland compensatory mitigation. Uh, we actually have a project in South Florida called Cherry Lake Wilderness Preserve. We're converting 1,200 acres of citrus into panther habitat and, and wetlands. And what, what is done here is the, the regulatory agencies, the water management districts, and the Corps of Engineers have uh, figured out a way to quantify horticultural outcomes. And that becomes the success criteria that is incorporated into the permit. And this allows the agencies to follow up over time and confirm that the permittee is meeting the conditions of their permit. So for example, it would be percent coverage of invasive species or number of stems of certain plant species per acre or a caliper and height on uh, over time, growth over time to, um, to quantify, measure, and certify that certain horticultural landscaping outcomes are being achieved. Um, so this next slide is about another form of certification, which is a little bit more of a, uh, of a, of a specific uh, segment of that chain of custody, and that is tree quality. So uh, tree growers are now focusing on how to certify that trees are being grown uh, to produce healthy root systems. It's very difficult to, to, to see roots and to know that you're getting good root systems. But as we've discussed, uh, minimizing inputs uh, is, is going to be supported by having uh, strong root systems and healthy plants that can uh, draw the inputs for themselves. So it's important. Um, but since you can't see the roots, you need to focus on something else. And what Reason 7 is doing is they're focusing on a process. And this process is based on on, on good research by the University of Florida and Dr. Gilman on how to grow roots. And um, uh, what, what the Reason Center growers are doing is they're subjecting themselves to the process and to auditing of the process so that uh, buyers, designers, um, anyone who's interested can be assured that they're receiving plants that have been produced a certain way, which are leading to um, higher quality root systems. So we see certification in a lot of different uh, different places and uh, moving towards a framework for certification of sustainable landscaping, I believe is the next step for our industry. And Pierce has some, some thoughts on this. Thanks, Tim. The um, University of Florida, IFAS Extension, of course, has been involved in different kinds or levels of certification programs for many years, not the least of which is Florida Friendly Landscaping, which we used to actually do visits to homes and, and do certifications. But most of the programs that we've been involved in, whether it's Energy Star or um, USGBC LEAD at different times, 
uh, are passive programs. So the concepts can be good, and we, we, we understand that they are good, but we have no idea how effective the implementation really is. Most of those programs are granted uh, prior to, to occupancy. If you go to the next slide. And so some of the ideas that we have about this uh, newer level of uh, certification program that we want to work on uh, are shown on this slide. And basically, uh, we um, want to create a more robust certification framework that's based on key metrics that we can directly measure and verify. For example, an easy one would be water budgets, uh, as I've shown earlier. It's getting increasingly easy to monitor water consumption at the household and subdivision level, uh, which would allow us to ask a participating development uh, to uh, meet a certain uh, water conservation adopt and, and, and not exceed a conservation water budget. Uh, and as shown earlier in the Madeira example, you could also provide information back to the HOA or to the developer about households that are having problems. Many times the kind of leak that we saw in Madeira, our use of water that we saw in Madeira is a leak, um, not just overwatering. Uh, data on fertilizers would have to be provided, self-reported. Presence of invasives obviously can be observed. So those are the kinds of things that we would, uh, different ways. One thing we can get from the water utilities, one thing we need to get from the landscaping professional community at fertilizers. And then one thing we can come in and observe, things like uh, pruning practices and invasives. We would like to see certification become a, a recurring event, uh, perhaps only for the first five years, uh, just to make sure that the practices are, are fully adopted within the community. Uh, you might wait until the HOA is taken over by the homeowners. You might go all the way through build out. Uh, that's all to be determined. Uh, and finally, we would like to see those, those budgets that are established take into account uh, annual trending. Uh, everybody knows that you need some, perhaps some water, better water conditions, irrigation conditions for establishment, but once the landscape is mature, you probably uh, could get by with uh, perhaps no water, no irrigation water at all, which uh, could be ideal. And of course, Madeira is an example. Um, next slide, Tim. The uh, there are two projects that we're working with uh, to try and test out these concepts. The first is in Alachua County. It's called the uh, 88th Street Cottages Project. We're working with uh, Robin Shore Homes is the developer. It's a small uh, project, 30 dwelling units on less than four acres, uh, very small lots. The developer wants to install irrigation free landscaping, uh, accomplish this by selecting a very drought tolerant plant material. Uh, and using hand watering through establishment, that's the plan. The site will uh, have some mass clearing, uh, not, not a lot, but um, and a little bit of contouring. Um, so the soils will likely be in fairly good shape, but in those areas that are impacted, uh, the plan is to amend with compost before landscapes are installed. The second uh, development, which is Turtle Beach, uh, is uh, a Mark Ruttenberg Homes project. And uh, we're working with uh, Ashley um, uh, Azell there. And this is in Pinellas County. It's a coastal redevelopment project. Uh, it will have virtually no clearing. So the soil conditions are very good. Uh, and so along with fertilization irrigation practices, I guess on this project, we're concerned with a management of pruning practices, mainly related to the established mangroves uh, and other established areas. So these are two projects where developers are actively working at, uh, with us to try out these concepts that I described earlier about a more uh, nuanced performance-based uh, certification program. Tim? So certification is hopefully one tangible next step that we can promote uh, collectively as an industry working together to define the standards um, and uh, the method of certification. A uh, couple other ideas that we want to just put out there and in, in, in concluding. Um, there's also the, the role of incentives, um, which come in many different forms. Um, we see them in, in different areas, uh, whether it's um, cost share for agriculture or uh, density bonuses. 
their models for um, incenting the private sector to adopt these practices. And I think this works hand in hand with certification uh, because this will make it easier for the a, a governmental agency to, to, to measure and to hold the, the project accountable. Um, and then uh, I'd also propose gamification as an idea for uh, promoting uh, conservation and, uh, and encouraging people to approach their landscaping in a more sustainable fashion. Um, gamification, we've all been exposed to it. It's, it's all over social media and, and different types of applications, but it's been used very effectively in energy conservation. There's a couple really cool apps out there called uh, Jewel Bug, Fuel Good, O Power. Um, there's some cool research uh, in Europe uh, on how to use the, these types of uh, social engagement and psychological reward tools to get people to think about how they can use less water on their landscape. And I think we have the technology, or we're getting pretty close to having the technology where these things could be, could be very effective. Uh, just a final slide I want to share. Um, the Cherry Lake um, has been involved with a project called A Thousand Trees for a Thousand Years. Uh, this is basically, um, we look to partner with communities um, who want to plant trees. And uh, we're looking to plant long-lived trees, uh, particularly bald cypress, in conservation areas where they have the potential to, to live for a very long time. Uh, the idea is we want to encourage uh, people to think about the future, to think about the role of trees in promoting a positive future for generations to come. So right now we're, we're getting ready to do several projects uh, with trees that we grew last year. And we're reaching out to other communities and partners who may be interested in planting a thousand trees in their community. Uh, if you're interested, reach out to me, tell me about your ideas for a project and we will uh, we'll grow the trees uh, the, um, to have them available next fall for people who would like to do a project in the fall. So that's uh, the conclusion of our presentation and um, I believe we have some time for questions. Okay, um, this is Vivian. Um, I just wanted to run over a few uh, quick housekeeping items. Um, we're going into the question and answer period. Um, I'm going to fly through this. If you have questions, use the questions panel on uh, questions box on your control panel to type them in. Uh, the PowerPoint is available on our website and also on the control panel. Um, the webinar has been approved for a number of credits. Uh, the follow-up email will have these credits as long as a link, as well as a link to a brief survey that we hope you'll complete. Um, you will also, um, down the road, be receiving further email alerts on our free upcoming events, so we encourage you to participate in them. Um, we hope you'll consider becoming um, a program sponsor or um, supporting 1,000 Friends of Florida as a member. Um, you can also support us through Amazon Smile. Um, every time you make a purchase through Amazon Smile, they make a small donation to us. So um, with this, I'd like to uh, move right into the questions and answers. We have a lot, so we're gonna try to um, get through as many of them um, as possible. Um, should, um, do you think uh, city and county government should limit the amount of turf in, in new residential and commercial areas? And if so, what is the most effective way to get started on this? My, pre my, my preference would be that the local governments um, work through the water utilities to limit the amount of water. Let, the, let, the, let them do whatever they want, uh, but just use a, an amount of water that's uh, consistent with the uh, consumptive use permit that the local water utility has and what makes sense in that area. Um, as Tim alluded to earlier, there are many ways, uh, if you want to go to the great lengths of, of using the water in very particular ways, you can have more turf. If you don't want to use it in other ways, if you want to do rain, rainwater capture, you could have, have more water uh, to supplement. But I think the idea is to give people the freedom to do what they want as long as they don't overuse the, the precious resource. That's my opinion. I, I, I agree. It, we, we focus on the quantitative um, outcomes in terms of inputs, and then people can decide how to landscape to meet those goals. 
Okay, are you any aware of any efforts to rework the Florida Friendly Guide, which does have, according to this person, about 40% of the plants being non-native? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll, I'll speak to the non-native uh, part of the question. Uh, I believe that uh, native plants are very important for sustainable landscaping and hopefully a very large percentage of the species that are utilized will be native. That being said, there's also a, a, a selection of plants that are not Florida natives, but very well adapted to our environment and that can play an important role in our landscapes. So I think it's a matter of balance. And when we're dealing with non-native plants, it's a matter of selecting specifically those plants which are well suited for our climate. And I'll speak to the other part of the question. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I'm not directly involved with the Florida Friendly Group, but you, I think you can address questions to Dr. Essen Mamal uh, at UF. Uh, she runs that program and I think they would be very open to, um, to conversations about what plants should be on the plant list. Okay. Um, we have a question from somebody asking if landscape professionals and related practitioners are able to obtain a certification in sustainable land management practices. Are you aware of any programs right now that, that offer that certification for professionals? I am not. Uh, Tim, you may know more than I do about that. No, not specifically for sustainable landscaping. I, I know there are pro programs uh, for uh, sustainable sites. Um, and also there's the uh, LEED Green Building and many planners and landscape architects are certified in those um, or, or yeah, have training and, and accreditation in those certification programs. Okay. Um, what advice would you have for individual homeowners who would like to reduce their water use and carbon footprint but are daunted by the upfront cost of relandscaping their property? Tim, you want to start with that? Yeah, I think the first, the first step is to water what you have less. Um, a lot of times we are overwatering our plants and, and causing the roots to, to, to rot, um, which makes it harder for them to take up water, which leads us to think they need even more. So we get into this cycle of overwatering. Um, it, just you know, paying close attention to the plants, observing them, um, um, maybe doing a little bit of probing in the soil to see if it's, if it's how dry or how wet it is. You kind of want it moist. You don't want it sopping wet and you don't want it um, flaky dry. So, you know, just using some common sense approaches to, to reducing the amount of water. And then if you notice that in your landscape, there are maybe certain beds or, or certain plants that are taking up a lot of water, then you might want to look at replacing those with uh, good alternatives from the Florida friendly list. Okay, Pierce, anything to add to that? No, that was a great answer. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any um, more ideas on commercial projects um, in terms of improving the survivability of plantings and reducing the water use? Well, you know, I think it's a lot of, of what we've been talking about. My, my view is that we need a higher level of professionalism from landscape contractors and land, landscape maintenance companies and that they also feel a greater degree of responsibility and accountability for managing the water inputs. That's not currently the way the industry is structured. We put a lot of pressure on our contractors to be low cost. Um, and so we're really incenting them to, to have low skilled labor and to focus only on the, on the essential steps and tasks to meet the scope that they're bidding. And there's never ever anything about managing water in those scopes. So we have to think about the structure of our industry and how that structure is promoting certain behaviors. Ultimately, we need a more professional uh, workforce. 
Okay, and we did have a comment come in um, about the Florida Water Star accredited professional certification is for landscapers who want certification in sustainable practices. So there is a program, but um, obviously there needs to be more um, education on and awareness of the program. So I just wanted to mention that that was in response to an earlier question. Um, we've got so many uh, detailed questions, and I kind of wanted to step back a bit and ask a, a bigger picture one. Um, you, you both gave some outstanding recommendations on what can be done to, um, you know, encourage, um, you know, developers and homeowners to um, understand the benefits of this from an economic standpoint, but what can be done from a to get even more awareness that following the practices that you're recommending saves the developers money, saves the municipalities money, and saves the homeowners money. What can be done, in your opinion, one or two things that would would add to that in addition to the gamification and other things that you, you recommended? Well, I would say the more we can focus on, on life cycle cost, um, the easier it becomes to demonstrate the return on investment for for developers and owners. And it's hard because there's oftentimes projects are, are, are built, uh, you know, financed and built by one party and then sold and then sold again. So it's not always the same owner who is going to be impacted by the cost at the different stages of life for the landscape. Um, now, if you're dealing with a, a university campus or municipality or, or maybe like a long-term owner, like a theme park, it's easier to focus on the life cycle cost. And what we can show is that, yes, we might save a little bit of money by making this choice at, at, at the design stage because it'll cost less to install and to build. But over 10 or 20 or 30 years, the maintenance costs are going to erode those savings and in fact uh, end up costing you more over time. So life cycle cost, I think, is a great, a great approach to helping to show the value. Pierce, do you have any other suggestions? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. We've got so many questions, and I'm trying to go through them here. Um, just trying to pull up one. Um, what um, interfacing, if any, is being done with um, – the uh, Florida Water Star and Florida Friendly Landscaping programs to try to integrate some of the recommendations that you're talking about, Piers? Uh, well, I work directly here at UF with um, the Center for Landscape Conservation Ecology and the uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping team of people. I'm in the same organization, IFAS, as they are. Uh, so we, uh, we cross paths regularly. Um, I also am very familiar with the uh, Florida Water Star program, um, and think they're doing a great job with that program. I especially like the way that Toho Water Authority has uh, effectively asked developers to um, to comport with that program. So, as we work out details on a particular site, uh, for example, the project I mentioned in Gainesville, the 88th Street Cottages, uh, what we want to be sure of is that that program of that landscaping program that they adopt. Uh, will in fact be certified as a Florida Water Star landscape. Um, we would like for it to be at the highest level of that certification because it, if it's successful, we'll have no irrigation, uh, no automated irrigation inputs. Um, so I, I think that we're going to be trying to work with those groups. I don't think that a lot of these groups, uh, Florida Water Star or Florida Printing Landscaping, have actually thought about landscapes like Madeira which don't have any inputs of fertilizer or water uh, at maturity. And so I think that that would be where I would want to work with them is to create that gold level or platinum level uh, of those programs that recognizes uh, ex you know, really low inputs. Uh, and once we get to that point, then the two programs effectively will become the same. That's my hope. Okay. Um, if a municipality or county wanted to get to the level of detail that you have, Pierce, in terms of water use in Gainesville and Alachua County, what is involved in that process? Can you talk a little bit about how you're able to track at such great detail what's going on? The, uh, 
we work with about five or six utilities right now. We work with Orange County Utilities, with or Orlando Utilities Commission, Toho Water Authority in Osceola County, the city of Apopka, uh, Seminole County Environmental, uh, GRU, which is effectively Alachua County. And we have worked with and are trying to reinitiate our work with Sarasota County. Most water utilities are public. Uh, they are in the sh sunshine nominally. Uh, we try to work with them and be sensitive to how they want the data to be accessed and used. Uh, but with any municipality uh, or county government, they usually have a pretty good relation with their water utility. If they do, uh, then we basically will engage with that utility to acquire the data. And then we get from the property appraiser at the county level uh, that data. And we combine the two to create the maps that I showed. Um, and we are particularly active right now in the Central Florida Water Initiative area uh, because they're trying to do very long range strategic planning and need to truly understand how effective their conservation programs are. Um, there are municipalities like Claremont that uh, do uh, restrict the amount of water that a homeowner can use uh, for irrigation to 35 inches a year, which is a lot of water, but you can't exceed that amount. Uh, we think that this kind of a program would be extremely helpful to that kind of uh, municipal water utility. Uh, so if anybody wants to know more about that, just contact me directly because we are actively taking on new utilities. Okay, um, this might be somewhat of a hot potato, but what about getting um, the Florida Friendly and Florida Water Star programs in a um, integrated into uh, code requirements statewide. What What is going on with regard to that? I know it's a, a very touchy subject. Well, the, uh, I think that the, and Tim may be able to answer a piece of this. Uh, I don't believe that the people who install irrigation systems are currently regulated at the state level. And I think that one of the best uh, benefits that have come from the Florida Water Star program is that it effectively offers a, uh, uh, a performance requirement for irrigation systems. And uh, you don't get that through the, uh, any kind of certification that the state offers. And of course, this gets right to Tim's point about professionalism. So um, I think that that's a, a very important thing that we should, uh, should move toward is uh, is some sort of certification and requirement for a statewide, uh, and that may be a hot potato, I don't know, I don't work with the irrigation folks too much, but I know that's an issue. Uh, I think Florida Friendly Landscaping is pretty nominally available and lots of developers and lots of development projects do actually uh, adopt it. Uh, I don't think there will be much resistance. But, Again, it's about the performance. It's about the water used, the fertilizers used, the pesticides needed, and frankly, Florida Friendly Landscaping doesn't address that. After occupancy, through those first five years, that's the part I'm concerned with. Right, so Florida Friendly Landscaping focuses on prescribing certain uh, practices uh, and approaches, so uh, selection of plants uh, um, is a big one, and. And, and those they're excellent recommendations. As Pierce is saying, they don't necessarily measure the outcomes, uh, which is a different approach. There is no statewide licensing for uh, irrigation contractors, landscape contractors, or maintenance contractors. Um, so you're limited into you're you're really limited in your ability to vet um, the people who are are performing these tasks. Um, and uh, I would say that we need to allow municipalities to incorporate things into their codes and ordinances that they are uh, capable of of inspecting. And uh, uh, because I think there's sometimes a risk if we put it in our codes, if we're not able to to enforce it, um, then it really undermines the the entire code and. Uh, so whatever we put in the code it needs to be something that's relatively easy to assess. Okay. Anything else to add, Pierce? Uh, no, except that uh, I think that the industry connection to the university is, is so critical. 
Uh, I mentioned several groups in, in addition to Cherry Lake. Uh, I mentioned the Life Soils Group, but also Massey Services, which does landscape maintenance. Uh, they have just recently adopted uh, offering a compost top dressing, and they're doing a fabulous job. And it gives us an opportunity to go research the impact of their practices in those residential uh, landscapes. So I do want to just reemphasize how much the university wants to work directly with industry groups uh, like this to, to promote these ideas. And perhaps as a final follow-up to that, Tim, as someone in the industry, what what do you think can be done to get the industry more engaged in, in following these practices and working with people like Pierce and following their research? Well, Pierce, Pierce has done a fantastic job over the years of, of engaging us and, and, and bringing the university a little bit closer to, you know, to our day-to-day -day, uh, concerns in the industry. Um, you know, we have, we keep our head down a lot of times. We're focused on, on, on just completing, you know, projects, and, you know, keeping people employed and, and running a business. So it, it helps to have, um, to have incentives in the marketplace to encourage these these things to happen, uh, whether it's uh, licensing and certification, um, you know, the more value more value add we create, um, the the more uh, opportunity there is for private companies to differentiate themselves and to acquire competitive advantage through knowledge and training and skills. So, uh, I think ultimately uh, a portion of the industry should really welcome this because it will it will uh, promote their their success and. So I'm looking forward to, to working with, with Pierce and, and hopefully many of you on the line today as we, we take it to the next stage. Okay, well, uh, we have run out of time with still a lot of questions left, so I apologize to those who didn't get responses, but I want to thank both of you for your, your really outstanding presentations today that I think, you know, really laid out clearly the, the future in terms of promoting water conservation and more sustainable landscaping. So with that, I am going to um, close today's webinar and encourage people to attend next month's webinar and also our workshops in uh, Martin and Palm Beach County later this month if you're in that area. So thank you to both of you for, for your outstanding presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.